The Iraqi regime likes to film itself at work. These pictures show Shia prisoners and senior officers from the regime. The tape reached the West two years later. The Americans did not interfere. Therefore, it took us only a few days to recover from the surprise, to reorganize our troops, reorganize our resources, and uh, impose peace and order in the southern governors. It took us two weeks to do that. Just a few miles away, half a million coalition troops began to leave Iraq. After months in the desert, they were returning home. The Allies still hoped one of Saddam's generals would overthrow him. But the ill-fated uprising had caused the military to rally round Saddam out of fear of something worse. The White House had miscalculated. Now there was a second uprising, in the north where the Kurds lived. Saddam had used chemical weapons to suppress previous revolts there, but the Kurds sensed weakness. The secret police headquarters in Suleymaniyeh was one of the regime's nerve centers. For years, Kurdish guerrillas had fought for independence. Now they united with mutinous troops and attacked. The men inside resisted desperately. They knew there was much to avenge. As night fell, the gates were stormed. A Kurdish teenager, educated in Britain, was there. He and his friends had listened to President Bush on the radio. When George Bush said that he would back up a people's revolution in Iraq, then they thought, that's all we need. That's all we wanted to hear, so they just did it. In the morning, the local people flocked to the burning building. Many were hoping to learn what had happened to family and friends who'd been imprisoned there. Some of Mustafa Aziz's school friends were among the missing. We were really scared because of this, you know, death camp which had been known that anyone who'd enter would never walk out again. We walked in towards this one room and we saw these hooks like you get in a butcher shop where they hang the meat on them and on one of the hooks we saw a body and you know we saw that, that they, the Iraqis would hook people on there. I thought how could they do this to people? There was bodies everywhere. Iraqi security officers all dead on the floor. It was raining as well at the time, and all the puddles would be just blood. I remember we just swearing at the Iraqis, and I remember going up to a couple of bodies and kicking them and spitting on them. Kurdish opposition leaders who'd been living abroad began to return. Suleiman Yir, was the heartland of the party run by Jalal Talabani. The Kurdish politicians wanted to trigger a coup against Saddam. They hoped a new Iraqi leader would let the Kurds run their own affairs. <laughs> Travelling with Talabani was an American, an observer from the United States Senate. He believes that day was a turning point. At that point, everything hung in the balance. Had the United States signaled its support for the uprising, I am convinced it would have succeeded. There were Iraqi generals who were, in fact, in touch with the 
opposition and who were sitting on the fence waiting to see what would happen. Uh, and when the United States did nothing, said nothing, sat on its hands, of course, they took the course of, of caution. That very night, Saddam Hussein's troops attacked. Washington had decided it did not want to support an uprising that might lead to the breakup of Iraq. The rebel forces fought back, but they were hopelessly outgunned. The Kurdish leaders who had encouraged the revolt had made a terrible miscalculation. As shells began landing on the cities, there was panic. Not only were the casualties heavy, but they feared a chemical attack at any moment. Refugees brought terrifying stories about the behavior of the advancing troops. Anyone over 15, anyone that was capable of carrying on, they shoot. They have got no mercy whatsoever. They came with an intention of revenge. I do not want to push American forces beyond our mandate. We've done the heavy lifting. Our kids perform with superior courage, and uh, they don't need uh, to be thrust into a war that's been going on for years. The Iraqi forces advanced relentlessly, and the cities of Kurdistan emptied before them. A million people were on the move. They headed for the mountains, trying to reach the safety of the Turkish and Iranian borders. reminded me of refugees leaving Paris in June 1940, just ahead of the German army. Everybody knew of George Bush's call for, for them to rise up and overthrow Saddam Hussein, and they all had exactly one question. Why isn't Bush helping us? The American air crews patrolling the skies above Iraq could see the Kurds being chased into the mountains, but they had strict orders not to intervene. Instead, they watched. We saw helicopters chasing a lot of people down a road, and we saw the gunships shooting at them. You could see the smoke coming out of the gunship and occasionally see flashes of the tracers, even though the sun had just started coming up. The Iraqi forces closed inexorably. But the president had promised America the troops were coming home. <laughs> the British wanted to set up safe havens for the Kurds. But the president refused. What was self-evident was that unless some action was taken, we may well be seeing the genocide of a nation. We found it intolerable, and for that reason, we began to proceed with our plans to do something about it. We did not want to take on the responsibility uh, for having to create a safe haven there. Uh, and if, if it was going to be enforced, it, it wasn't going to be uh, enforced by others. It was going to have to be enforced by, uh, by Uncle Whiskers, and we really didn't want to do it. Baker's public relations team suggested a visit to the Kurds. As we were flying along, we all of a sudden saw a whole sea of people camped out in the mountains, and this was early spring when it was quite uh, cold. We landed there, and then we took four-wheel drive vehicles up the mountain. There were 50 to 75,000 people in this uh, little valley. 